So our discussion this week starts with um, credit. Um, what are some advantages of uh, using credit? Well, credit, not, credit is not always bad. There are some good things that uh, we achieve with credit. And as long as we, we um, can maintain our financial discipline, we could actually establish and reach to our financial goals. And credit is a significant part of our um, financial structure. And uh, it is a very important tool uh, in reaching our financial um, targets. So without credit, it's really hard to own uh, expensive items. And expensive doesn't necessarily mean luxury or unnecessary. It's just uh, without credit, you know, some of the items we simply cannot, um, may not be able to afford them. So for instance, if you want to buy a car, you know, a, um, you know, want to spend a, a reliable car, maybe ten, fifteen thousand dollars um, you know, you may not have the cash to buy the car in cash. And therefore, unless you obtain credit, you simply will not be able to buy um, a, 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 you know, car that's worth more than the cash that you have. So, you know, without having the car, you may not be able to go to work, you may not be able to go to school. And, you know, if you cannot obtain the credit and if you don't have the cash, then you can't have the car, then you can't go to work, you can't go to school, and you simply cannot achieve some of the things that you want to achieve. So, the credit becomes uh, very important in achieving. Uh, a transportation vehicle, and, and in this case, uh, a, the example is the car. Uh, same thing goes with a house. Um, you know, owning a house, you build equity, you basically save money. Um, it is part of everybody's financial discipline to um, try to create some sort of um, a nest egg for our future, for our retirement. And usually a house or buying a house becomes an important aspect in this financial planning. Uh, however, I'm not sure if I know anybody who actually buys a house in cash. Uh, so say you want to buy a house for $200,000. Um, it's, I, I'm assuming it's quite rare for people to come out and pay the $200,000 in cash and buy the house. So the most common way to purchase a house is on credit, uh, with a very special credit referred to as a mortgage. Uh, very common to have a 30-year credit, uh, less common, but as um, available, 20-year uh, mortgage. And really is pretty much the only way nowadays to own a house is through credit. A lot of uh, lenders will require you to put down some sort of a deposit. However, majority of the value in the house will be, uh, again, more than likely on credit. Um, education, again, um, you know, there are scholarships available, there's always cash payment, but majority of students nowadays actually do have um, or do use credit uh, student loans to pay for education. So owning these items that are expensive and, and very hard to obtain uh, with cash, credit is the way to finance these uh, items. So these are the advantages of using credit. So another advantage is, um, you know, using credit cards effectively. And I have an example that I want to go through. Uh, I've been watching these TV commercials that talk about this new uh, Chase card that gives you rebates and, uh, and, and you know, the card looks fantastic. So, you know, I, I just wanted to, you know, go over this example with you now that, you know, we're talking about advantages of using credit. So credit card is not evil, obviously, but it requires a lot of financial discipline. Um, it is so easy to have the temptation to overspend, to buy things that we wouldn't be able to afford uh, on cash, um, you know, go to expensive restaurants, which we wouldn't have if, if we were to go with cash. Um, or, or buy things that we cannot otherwise afford. Anyways, let's go over this example of, um, so the credit cards 
chase.com. Again, I'm not saying this is good. I'm not saying this is bad. All I'm saying really is let's take a look at it. It's just an example. Um, so again, I've been seeing this on TV commercials and um, it actually offers 3% cash back offer. So we talked about this in our previous week's discussion. Uh, credit cards work in a way in which you spend the money during the month and then you have a cutoff and then at that cutoff, the bank expects you to make a payment. If you pay at that cutoff and you pay it all, then you do not pay interest. And you can still have the 3% cash back. But we're gonna see if this 3% is really 3% or, or if there's a catch, and I bet that there is a catch. However, for now, it says 3% cash back offer, and it is a you know, legitimate cash back offer. And notice, if you pay it at that cutoff and you've been spending money using this credit card within your means and you kept to your financial discipline, whatever you spent, you get 3% of it back. So with respect to advantages of using credit, as long as you can keep your financial discipline, using this credit card for the purposes of rebates, it actually becomes a tool where you can save money. So let's just to take, take a look, learn more. So cash back on every purchase, earn up to $600, so there's a maximum. Um, you know, up to first year, so I'm sure that it changes the second year. Uh, there's a $20,000 maximum after which you earn one and a half percent. Still, you know, one and a half percent is not all that bad. So you, you, in, you know, you spend a thousand dollars and you get $15 back. And um, if you were to spend the same thousand dollars in cash, you get nothing back. So it basically saves you $15 just because you use this credit card. And I'm sure. Uh, you know, I've been seeing other TV commercials where, you know, the banks are saying that you get 2% back, 3% back, and, you know, there is no annual fee in this card, and there are several di different credit cards that doesn't have an annual fee. So it, it is quite convenient to use these credit cards and uh, save money through these rebates and uh, pay no interest as long as you can keep your financial discipline off, you know, spending within your means and paying it. Uh, at the cutoff uh, without having to pay the interest. So now that we are looking at it, let's take a look at the um, APR, uh, the interest that you pay if you pass that cutoff. And um, it says they have an introductory APR for 15 months, which is zero. So they want to lure you in, you know, they want you to come in. Therefore, they're saying for the first year you pay zero. Uh, but after that, it is 17% to about 26 percent and this is an annual rate so if you actually borrow a thousand dollars you will pay 250 dollar interest because actually more than that 260 dollars of an interest in one year for having a debt of a thousand dollars this is incredibly high. This is the worst interest that a person can have. This is a credit card trap. And I'm, again, I'm not saying this for Chase. I'm just saying, this is just an example. I'm just saying this for every credit card. The credit cards work uh, for the, with the principle of you spend the money, and the bank is expecting that you don't pay it by the cutoff and then they make money through these incredibly high credit card rates, interest rates. However, if you pay it immediately after the cutoff and you don't have to pay the interest, well then there are very advantages like the cash back, like no annual fee and uh, there are insurance and, and so on and so forth. So um, again, this is the highest interest rate um, and again, not specifically Chase, it's just the credit card APRs are known to be the highest interest rates that consumers can have. So if you were to get, for instance, uh, equity loans or installments that we're going to see in later chapters, uh, the interest costs or the interest that you pay will be substantially lower than this. So there are you know, other 
advantages of using a credit card. Uh, for instance, they provide insurance. Um, <clears throat> so every credit card is different, uh, but the credit card that I use, for instance, provides insurance for uh, buying items. So for instance, you know, you buy an item from Best Buy and then, um, you know, something happens to get stolen, uh, your credit card actually has insurance for it. Um, again, it depends on the credit card that you have, uh, but most pr credit cards will offer some sort of insurance as to the items or services that you, you use or you purchase through the credit card. Uh, check to make sure that you have it, but um, this is one of the biggest advantages of using a credit card. Another insurance is, um, for instance, you rent a car, um, you know, a lot of the times, again, it, it depends on the credit card that you use. However, my credit card, for instance, offers, the Visa offers um, a insurance for renting the car, um, some level of liability, some level of collusion, and so on and so forth. And the bank, separately, other than Visa, for the same credit card, offers a different level of um, insurance for, against theft and collusion and some sort of deductible coverage and, and so on and so forth. So, you know, every credit card different, but most offer some sort of insurance for purchases and services rendered and so on and so forth. So, and, and they are, like in this case, no annual fee, and I don't know what sort of insurance that they offer, but, um, so additional benefits, redeem your cashback rewards, uh, service and protection, zero liability protection, purchase protection. So this one, for instance, covers your new purchases for 120 days against damage or theft up to $500 per claim and $50,000 per, per account. So, you know, you go to Best Buy and you buy a TV for $400 and get stolen within the first four months and, you know, your, your credit card will pay you. Uh, there's extended warranty protection, fraud protection, fraud alerts, um, and so on and so forth. So it's not always the worst thing to use uh, a credit card. So in this sense, there's fraud protection. So let's just see what it is. Um, so it says fraud protection. We help safeguard your account using sophisticated real-time fraud monitoring. We can, you can rest easier knowing that your card transactions will be monitored for possible signs of fraudulent activity. So in my case, for instance, the credit card that I'm using, what happens is whenever I go to a, a, a foreign country, um, I use my credit card, I get declined. <laughs> and, uh, and I get a text message and it says fraud protection de uh, declined. Please call this number and verify that it is you who's using the credit card, blah, blah. Um, so, you know, at the beginning, I was really annoyed about this, but then I realized this is for my own protection. Uh, if I were to lose the credit card and somebody were to use it in some odd country and uh, in a thousands of dollars, although I don't have that much limit, but, uh, you know, significant amount, then, um, you know, they will be declined because of this fraud protection. So, Basically, what I do now is before I leave the country, I call the bank and I tell them within these dates, I will be spending money in a in this specific country. And they basically add that to the fraud protection and I don't get declined and the card is still protected. They also monitor fraud alerts through unusual activity. Um, and Chase can notify you by phone, text, and email. And this is very important. When you have a checking account, saving account, and uh, a credit card, um, you can have a notification um, a, um, settings. So for instance, for my own account, for instance, what I have is um, notify me with a text message, uh, any activity that is over $1. So what happens is, Anytime any activity happens in any of my accounts, including checking, savings, and credit card, I get a text message. So this way, I know that if, if somebody were to steal my credit card and uh, starts using the credit card, well, I will know that my card is stolen and being used after the first transaction. And I can call the bank and immediately put a stop to it. And in most cases, if you actually contact the bank within the first um, you know, a couple of days, they will be very accommodating and there are legal, you can read your book about it, depending on the state, um, there are 
uh, I think within two days you have no liability. But again, check to make sure that this hasn't changed already. Uh, but if you were to you know, alert the bank immediately after you get that text message, uh, they're very, very helpful. It did happen to me a few times. And, uh, and it is fact of life. It will happen to you too, if I can assure you. Um, it will happen. It, it just, it, you know, things happen. So it is best to be ready for it. And uh, it is best to make sure that you have that setting in your account that notifies you of every activity in the account. Um, using a credit card is convenient. So think of it like you go to a restaurant and you want to pay. Uh, they bring you the check and uh, you start going, okay, you know, $11, $12, $13, $14. It just, you know, it just, or say you're going to buy a, you know, a TV that's a couple of thousand dollars. Um, you know, what are you going to do? Carry a couple of thousand dollars in cash to Best Buy and buy your TV. It's just not, not feasible, not, not reasonable. So, you know, having a credit card is so easy, so convenient. You know, why not? Um, also, you know, for instance, for myself, I use Amazon.com a lot. How am I going to pay cash? It's just not possible. It's not even an option. So the only way to pay for it is, is, is a credit card. So it adds a convenience. I could perhaps use a debit card. So in this case, let me explain the difference between a credit card and a debit card. A credit card allows you to have a, um, a debt. Basically, you're borrowing money. A debit card allows you to use the money that you have in your checking account. And we talked about this last week, but just to reemphasize, a debit card is directly connected to your checking account and you basically are using the cash in your checking account. Now, most debit cards will have either Visa or MasterCard logo. It just means that this debit card can be used at any POS machine, point of sale machine, or online that accepts Visa or MasterCard. Uh, they are not credit cards, and they do not have uh, most of the services that a credit card would have, such as they may not have rebates, they may not have insurance, they may not have fraud protection. For instance, my debit card offers no rebates, no insurance, no fraud protection. So I hardly ever use my debit card. In fact, uh, I'm not sure if I actually put it in my wallet. I mean, I have it, but it just... No insurance, no fraud protection, it, it's just incredibly dangerous. So credit card offering these benefits makes it so convenient just to use the credit card. Again, it's just important to keep that financial discipline. So there's insurance credit and you know it's, it's nice to have a credit card for emergency. So for instance, I have a second credit card. I keep it completely unused and that's my emergency credit card. If anything goes wrong and again, Things happen in life and you have a need to pay something urgently, uh, you know, an accident, a hospital, something. And um, you can actually use a credit card to pay for that emergency. There are obvious disadvantages of using a credit card. Um, you will have the temptation to overspend. Uh, there is cost of credit. You, you pass that um, the cutoff, you are paying 26%. You know, we looked at the example. In the example, it was um, you know between 17 to 26 percent. Um, so you risk not having that financial discipline. You you risk paying 26 percent a year on the money that you borrow. Um, risk of bad credit history. So uh, you know we'll, we'll talk about it just in a minute. But now that you know we're, we're talking about what a credit history is. Um, there are three credit bureaus in the United States. They're Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax. These credit bureaus keep track of everything that you do based on your identity. Uh, that's your social security number, your name, and your date of birth, and blah, blah. So based on these uh, criteria, every credit bureau has your credit history. How many credit cards you have, how much credit you have, how much of that credit do you use? How much of it do you pay? Uh, what, you know, some of them actually have what type of transactions you have. Um, you know, if, if you had any sort of disputes with anybody, including your landlord, your utility bills, your phone bill, um, any credit that you have will go to the credit bureau and they will have all your credit activity in a file. 
that's a credit history. And that history will go many, 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 many years. In fact, the longer the history, better for you. So you want to actually start that history as soon as possible because the longer the history, better for you. Now, one of the disadvantages of using credit is, especially using it early, is well, while you want to have it as long as possible, but you also want to make sure that you know, if you are in a very financially tight situation, uh, you may want to avoid using credit because that tight situation is reported on your uh, credit history and it will look bad on your credit history. 10 years down the road, uh, you want to buy a car, you want to buy a house, the lender will check your credit history and will see that you were at a tight spot 10 years ago and um, they may actually use that against you to give you a higher interest or deny you credit. You pretty much lose your privacy uh, and you are exposed to identity theft. You lose your privacy because somebody is following your credit history. You know, there are three credit bureaus and they know what you're doing. They're watching every transaction that you do and therefore you lose your you know, privacy. So, and there's always a risk of somebody stealing your identity, somebody stealing your uh, social security number and, um, you know, having credit card on their, on your name and spending it. So these are risks. And having too much debt obviously will give you uh, stress. So, you know, the financial stress can be burdensome, burdensome on a person. It could actually have uh, significant um, results. So it is important to establish a good uh, credit history. So in order to have a good credit history, you need to make sure that you have a reasonable uh, debt. So you have to limit it. So there are um, three very common gauges that you know, credit bureaus use um, to, you know, to see if you have you know, too much debt. There is the uh, continuous debt, and these are industry terms. So it's very common that you know, banks use these terms uh, or credit bureaus use these terms. A continuous debt simply means that uh, you should have no debt every four years. So basically means that your outstanding debt should be payable in four years based on your current salary. Uh, when we say debt, we mean non-mortgage debt, so credit card revolving debt. Um, credit card debt, installment debt, and so on and so forth. You should be able to pay them off in four years given your current income. Uh, debt payments to disposable income. So your non-mortgage debt payments, the payments that you make for credit cards, uh, when you divide it by your disposable income, that is the income that you have left after your, um, <clears throat> you know, after the payments that you have to make, such as mortgages, such as insurance, and, and such as tax. So your non-mortgage debt payments divided by your disposable income um, should be less than 15%. And the third one is debt to income. So all your monthly debt, including the mortgage, and your total gross monthly income uh, should be less than 36%. So one third of your income um, can be total debt payments, but no more. Um, <clears throat> with respect to the student loans, you should know how much outstanding debt you have, you should follow it, and you should know your minimum monthly payment, and you should make it. And um, it, it is a good practice to consolidate it, so it's much easier to keep track of it, and uh, consolidated student loans usually, get lo um, usually can get lower rates. Um, credit history is very, very important and you really don't want to have any sort of problem on your credit history. And if you see anything that's not right, uh, you should dispute it. Now, it is important that you start your credit history as early as possible, but it's also important that you actually keep your credit history as spotless as possible. Therefore, if you're in a financial tight spot, maybe you should avoid trying to get a debt um, because you know, it will actually go into your credit history. Um, you have a right to obtain your credit report with the credit bureaus once a year um, with no charge. Um, but most of the banks now offer you once a month credit report 
uh, some of them are free, some of them like a, you know, a dollar or you know, a few dollars. And, and I think it's worth it. Um, and I also would suggest, um, and I have it, uh, you could actually get a membership with the credit bureaus. So for instance, I have a membership with Equifax and um, I follow my credit report every month. And uh, just to make sure that everything that I have is um, correct. And um, I don't know exactly how much I'm paying, but I think it's somewhere around like $25 a month. And there are certain things that you can do with that membership. For instance, um, and, and I would suggest doing these um, certain steps to avoid uh, having your identity stolen. So for instance, I have what's called a fraud alert. Fraud alert means that I have been a victim of uh, identity theft before and therefore be on the watch out. So when you give a fraud alert to your credit bureau that you are a member, that you're paying the fee, they will actually report it to the other uh, credit bureaus. So everyone will know that you've been a victim of um, identity theft. Now, you don't have to be a victim. And even though you're, you haven't been a victim, you can still put a fraud alert and um, just because you're concerned that you may be a victim. And therefore, um, I did that. And, um, and so, for instance, if anybody were to check my credit score without my knowledge, uh, all three would not give any sort of information about my credit score or my credit history to nobody they would contact me, get a permission, and then release my uh, credit information. And it just makes it really, really hard for me to use my own credit history. However, it's well worth it because then it also makes it very hard for other people to use my credit history and to steal my identity. Now, it is very much like a car alarm. It is not it's, you know, a method you know that that is solid like you you do this and your identity won't be stolen it just, there's no such thing it still can be stolen it just makes it harder and the people who look at stealing identity see this and they just move on to the next person it, it's just like a car alarm you know there are two cars standing one of them has an alarm and the other one doesn't well the one doesn't have it it's just easier so why don't i just mess with the alarm just go with this one so why don't I mess with the person who actually has the fraud alert? I would just go with this guy. Um, you could also put a freeze on your credit score and credit history, which means that unless you unlock it, no one can check it. Um, so these are some of the services, and they have additional ones, but being a member with uh, one of, or purchasing a service with one of the credit bureaus is, is very, very effective uh, way of you know fighting against the identity theft and also keeping track of your credit history um, so how do we build the credit history uh, you should definitely have a checking and savings account and uh, and I would also strongly suggest having a brokerage account most brokerage accounts do not do not ask you to put much money in it a couple of hundred thousand not a couple of hundred dollars uh, Will, will suffice and then you'll have a uh, brokerage account it actually um, will go towards your credit history uh, make sure that you have utility uh, bills on your name and you make regular payments you miss those payments they report to the credit agency so it's very very important that you keep up with your uh, bills um, your student loan payments should be regular and you should not skip any payments they report to the credit agencies and most lenders are very very sensitive about student loan payments um, if you do not have a credit card yet, it is a good practice to get a card and it may not be possible to get a regular card, but one of the ways to get an easy credit card is, uh, store cards, you know, go to Macy's or JCPenney or Best Buy. And, uh, because, you know, they want to have you as a customer, they're a lot more motivated to give you a store card. Uh, most store cards are credit cards. And in fact, if you look at the back of it, that you will see a name of a bank. Uh, Citibank is very common. Bank of America is very common. 
And, uh, but their limits will be very small. It, it will be like $200, $500, you know, $1,000 at max. And, uh, and as long as you keep your financial discipline and you spend within your means and pay the balance uh, by the deadline, you won't incur any interest and you will create a good credit history. And then uh, once you can, obtain a regular credit card. Now, one thing that I need to say is checking your credit score or your credit history lowers your credit score. So if you do it yourself, it does not. However, if you apply for a credit card and give them a permission to check your credit score, then that check itself will lower your credit score. So if you apply to five different credit cards and you're hoping, them, hoping that one of them will accept it, they, they will actually have every card will check your credit score and credit history and you will have five checks on your credit history and credit score and your credit score will go down five times. So it is in your best interest to choose a credit card now and stick with it. And preferably just have one card and, and that's it. Um, so be careful with you know, how many times you apply for cards, how many uh, store cards you get, and, and, and you know, just know that the more people check on your credit score, um, the more your credit score will go down. Unless you give them permission, by the way, they cannot check, check your credit. And um, you could always complain. Uh, if they do, you could always complain with the credit bureau that they did not have your authorization to check your credit score and, uh, they, uh, and they should not uh, impact your credit score based on that. Um, credit score is your credit worthiness. So based on your credit history, they give you a score. Uh, you get an A, you get a B, you get a C, just like a, a, a grade. Um, it, it is a score, uh, you know, up, up to 800 and, um, you know, having something like a 700 is an excellent, something between six and 700 is it's a good credit and, uh, you know, somewhere around 400, 500 is okay, but it's not that good. Uh, so based on that credit score, lenders will um, basically decide whether you are credit worthy which means they can deny you credit. So if you don't have high enough credit score and you wanna buy a car or you wanna buy a house, they may say no. You don't have a good credit score so we won't give you money. You wanna lease a car, they require excellent credit score, which means that if it is not above, I think 720, um, you won't be able to get a car, you won't be able to lease a car. Um, so, Credit score is important, and there are ways to improve your credit score. Um, for instance, they're going to look at your payment history, so never skip a payment. Um, and in fact, if you skip a payment, remember how we looked at the, uh, the APR, 26%? If you skip a payment, if you skip a minimum payment, you will get a nasty letter from the bank, and if this 26% will even increase more. They will penalize you. And, uh, and you really don't want that because they will also report to the credit agencies and your credit score will go down. And even 10, 15 years down the road, it will actually appear on your credit history. And it's just, it's just terrible. So make sure that you pay the minimum. Um, the credit usage is very important. So for instance, let's say you have a $1,000 balance on your credit card. Uh, make sure you don't, you don't use it all. Um, if you use, say, 80% of it, $800 out of a $1,000 limit, that's bad. And it will impact your credit score negatively. So you wanna keep it less than 50% and um, preferably 20, 30%. So this is risky though. So it's, it's optimization, it's a fine line. So you know, it, it's not that easy, but um, having too much credit exposes you to fraud. So for instance, say you got a credit card with a $10,000 limit, and you lose the card, or you get stolen, you know, your wallet got picked. Well, you lost a credit card with $10,000 in it. 
So <laughs> it's risky. But if you have a thousand dollars, well then you end up using most of it and then your percentage of usage goes up and your credit score goes down. So you have to be careful as, <clears throat> as to how much of a credit you get and how much of it, of that credit do you use. And you wanna keep that utility, uh, the usage uh, low. Length of credit is very important. Uh, you need to have as long as you can. The longer it is, better it is. Um, how much credit you have is important. Uh, credit companies, the bureaus usually look at um, you know, increasing credit, but not, not jumps. So slightly increasing, gradually increasing is good, uh, but not, uh, you, know, you, know, you have a $2,000, $2,000, and $15,000 will negatively impact your credit. And the type of credit, you know, it, it is really, credit companies look at uh, mortgages as a very positive way of borrowing, uh, car financing, Consumer loans, uh, these are you know, considered to be uh, good financial um, credit uh, or good type of credits. Uh, but having too many credit cards, um, store cards, it, it is not. So the revolving accounts, uh, you, you want to be careful with um, having too much uh, balance in them. So it is a good habit to, you know, I personally, for instance, spend about a day um, every month and then frequently every week uh, just to look, you know, go over my uh, balance in the accounts, checking account, balance, savings account, and the brokerage account, just to make sure that everything is in, in order, no money stolen and, and stuff like that. And then it's also a very good uh, practice to spend about a day in a month uh, to look at your credit report, look at your credit history, just to go over to see if everything is legit, everything is in order, and if not, then you can challenge it. And if once you challenge it with the bureau, uh, they have 45 days to investigate, otherwise um, you could actually complain. So how do you know if you have too much debt? Well, if you don't know your total debt, then, <laughs> then that means you have too much debt. Um, you get your paycheck and all goes to the minimum payments and you know you have too much debt and you're in trouble. That means you didn't keep up your financial discipline and you are in trouble. You max out your credit cards. In fact, you max it out so much that you actually get a new card just to pay the old one. So you know that you're in too much debt. You can't pay the minimums. That's too much debt. You feel like you need to refinance because minimum payments are too much. Well, then again, you have too much debt. If you feel like you need to use debt consolidation loans, then that's a very good sign that you actually need to uh, reconsider, um, stop using your credit cards or try to find a way to uh, refinance and lower your interest payments at least. Uh, you receive late payment mail from credit card companies. That's actually bad. That means you missed the minimum payment. That's in your credit history. I really do hope it never happens. Uh, it's really, really hard to recover from that. It takes years, um, but then you know you have too much debt. You receive collection calls. Again, it, it's bad for your financial history. It's bad for your financial score, uh, credit score. It takes years to recover from it, and um, I really do hope it, you, know, you never actually receive a call, a collection call. So how do you reduce excess debt? Um, you should know your credit balances. You should know your monthly payments. You should be on top of it. Um, financial health is just as important as your physical health um, because they go hand in hand. If you have too much debt, you will be stressed and you, you know, you will have, it, it will affect everything. It will affect your mental status. It will affect your job performance. It will affect your marriage. It will affect your um, psyche. It will affect your driving. I mean, it, money is fact of life and everybody has, wants to have a lot, but unfortunately, I never met anybody who says I have enough. So um, you should know how much credit balance you have and how much monthly payments you have, and at least being on top of it and uh, having that balance of income and debt gives you some sort of uh, feeling that you are on top of it, you are managing it, you're working it. Uh, you need to have a budget. It's very important. You need to have a budget. You need to have uh, you know, a balanced budget, not necessarily a surplus, but not a deficit. 
So you need to have a budget and you need to follow it. Um, you need to reduce your expenses and do not take any more credit. Um, sometimes this is easier said than done. I mean, you have, uh, you know, you have a kid, you have health payments, you have rent, you got to eat, you know, been there, done that. What are you going to do? Uh, so it's easier said than done, but sometimes, you know, you, you have to, because, uh, some of the expenses or some of the issues like these will affect you so bad in the future that, you know, reducing these expenses right now. Um, are, are, are really important. So, you know, unfortunately, that sometimes uh, is a must do. And, and consider refinancing. Now, this is not that bad. Um, think of it like this. This credit card says any debt amount that you have, you have a 26% interest. Again, it's like, oh my God. And, you know, I, I am surprised how this is legal, but it is. So say you have a $10,000 debt. $10,000 debt means at the end of the year, you're going to have $2,600 more off it. So $12,600 $12, all in all debt just because of the interest. Now you've got to pay $12,600. So there are services. What you can do is you can get a consumer credit. And with a consumer credit, you could consolidate all your credit cards into one installment payment, and you could get a credit interest rate on the installment account significantly lower than this. Um, sometimes, you know, nowadays, you know, 10%, 11%, depending on if you can provide a collateral, um, 5%, 6%. Uh, collateral could be a person who co-signs with you. Um, you know, if you have a car, some, some places put a lien on your car and, and use that as a, as a collateral. If you have a house and you paid some of it, um, you know, you, you could actually get a, a credit, like a second mortgage or, um, you know, equity backed uh, consumer loan. And you could get, you know, interest rates as low as five or 6%. So consider that versus a 26%. So reconsolidation is, is, is not all that bad. It, it is actually uh, a, a very reasonable way to reduce your excess debt. It's, it may be the first step into resolving your current situation. However, uh, many of the people who actually tell you that they're advisors and uh, they're going to do this for you and, uh, and you, know, you just have to pay them $500 first and then they're going to do it for you, um, that, that I, I am skeptical. Um, you know, it, it just, not everybody is as capable, not everybody's licensed, not everybody is well intended. So you have to be very careful about who you are actually working with. Don't forget, you are going to give these people advisors um, and they're not licensed. And um, these advisors, your social security number, your personal, most intimate financial details of your, um, of you, you're going to give it to these people and um, they could simply steal your identity. They could do a bad job. They could be working for a company who actually gives out installment loans at a very high rate. So for instance, they could be working for a company who actually is given installment credit at 15%. To you, it may be like a miracle because you go from 26% down to 15 and it's like a fantastic job. But it's potent. It's likely that you could have actually gotten like as low as eight or nine percent, or even with a collateral as low as maybe six percent. And uh, the guy just sold it to you at fifteen. So be careful as who you actually hire to to help with uh, refinancing or consolidating your loans. Um, so we'll continue with the other chapters, but for this chapter, uh, this is about it. So thank you.